Now, I would like to call everybody's attention to what I've written about this. Uh, this is in uh, my website, right, tarpley.net, and uh, it's the, the, the article involved starts from the coup d'etat of April 12th, 1945, in Washington. We're sort of getting into that, the geometry of that anniversary, right, 70 years ago. Uh, April 12th, 1945, Roosevelt died, but of course he didn't just die, he was poisoned. This was an assassination. And to, to sort of set the framework for the entire thing. After the war, the uh, son of President Roosevelt, and this is um, Elliot Roosevelt, mm -hmm. went to meet with Stalin. He went to visit Stalin in the Kremlin uh, to interview him, right? to interview him for a, a U.S. Uh, publication, right? journalism, I think it was Look Magazine, Gardner Cowles. So uh, during the course of this, Stalin said, um, I have a, a resentment against your mother, Eleanor Roosevelt, because she would never let Ambassador Gromyko of the Soviets view the the body, uh, the dead body of uh, of President Roosevelt. Right? She always insisted that the coffin be kept closed. Mm -hmm. And Stalin said that he he resented this very much because Gromyko uh, had uh, tr training enough to be able to recognize the symptoms of poisoning. So he told the guy that he that Stalin first told this was. U.S. Ambassador Avril Harriman of Skull and Bones and the, uh, the mm -hmm. Brown Brothers Harriman yeah. uh, Banking House, uh, co-partner with Prescott Bush, who financed Hitler, and, and the rest of it. Stalin said to Harriman immediately, I believe he was poisoned. I want my ambassador to view the body. So that was sent in, but the, Mrs. Roosevelt kept saying no. And then... Stalin turned to Elliot Roosevelt, and this is now back to the after-the-war meeting, and said, look, you don't seem to understand, your father was murdered. And, and uh, Elliot Roosevelt is shocked. What do you mean murdered? Right? This was supposedly a, uh, you know, natural causes. And Stalin then, according to the, uh, the text, the text was only published in uh, the mid-80s, mid-1980s. You can see all the stuff on toply.net. It's called British Coup d'etat in Washington, April 12, 1945, how the Harriman gang started the Cold War. Uh, uh, so, uh, this, Stalin uh, says, this, uh, your father me, was sir. murdered. Hang on. Yeah, your right father on. was murdered. What do you mean murdered? By whom? Stalin roars by the Churchill gang. And then, he, uh, then Stalin also says, not only did they successfully kill your father, they've been trying to kill me, Stalin, ever since. Uh, uh, so, this uh -huh. obviously compels... Uh, attention. So we have it corroborated, right? Mm -hmm. The original report from Harriman that goes to the State Department mentions Stalin thinks that the president was poisoned and wants Gromyko to view the body. Mm -hmm. And then we have this other story, 46 or thereabouts, right, after the war, where Stalin says the same thing to Elliot Roosevelt, who very unwisely d didn't uh, publish it, should have been published uh, in a timely way, but wasn't. He, he waited, he waited, uh, what? 40 years to, to publish it. Not, yeah. not so good. So this is sort of the, uh, the terrain. And look, just to, uh, to complete this sort of framework before we go into the political issues, mm -hmm. if you look at the U.S. delegation at Yalta, right, so they, they have to go all the way to the Black Sea, and this is a very complex combination um, trip. Uh, they're then housed in these old czarist palaces, some of which had been used as uh, vacation homes for workers or the wounded in World War II. But they're in bad shape, right, because everything in the Soviet Union is bad, badly kept because of the tremendous drain of the, of the war, right, unimaginable by anybody else in the world. So there are rats and the, pump, the plumbing is bad and so forth. But on the way home from the Yalta conference, uh, one, one top member of the U.S. delegation drops dead. And that is this guy, Pa Watson, the military advisor to President Roosevelt, who had served him for quite a number of years. And this was a tremendous psychological blow. He died sailing home. Harry Hopkins, one of the, the absolute key people in the economic recovery and then in the Lend-Lease deliveries, right, the U.S. economic mobilization to right. keep Russia... Britain and China, all three of those, 
they, uh, quite likely one or more of them would have collapsed if it hadn't been for these Lend-Lease deliveries, right? Well, basically, you take it, right? We don't care. We'll, we'll worry about the money later. We're lending it or leasing it to you. We'll discuss the terms later. Right, right now, we have to win the war. Tremendous yeah. thing. So that's Harry Hopkins. He is so sick that he has to drop out of the, uh, the, the convoy going home and go to Spain and try to survive. He, he had just a few more months to live when, it, when you came right down to it. What, what did he and, die of? And, uh, well, he had, he had some long-standing medical problems, right? Hard, hard to, uh, especially for a non-medical doctor like myself. But he had, he, he had been, even at the beginning of the war, he had relied on you know, injections to keep himself going. Uh-huh. But then we have, then of course Roosevelt, and Roosevelt uh, will will of course die. Then what? February, March, uh, April, right? Two two and a half months uh, later. So look at the mortality rate in the U.S. delegation. It suggests that that all was not well with the security, <laughs> right? That you, there you was might something say else that. going on. Yeah. Now the the Roosevelt poisoning has been talked about. Uh, you know, not necessarily at the front, but it's been talked about in the background for years and years. And it would suggest, if you watch the man in pictures, that this poisoning took place over a period of time. Uh, he really deteriorated in the last several months. I mean, he looked like yeah. walking well, that's, death. The last several months are the post-Yalta months. So the argument that's, that's could very well be that's right. that somebody, again, one of the delegations present uh, decided to do away with him. There's also the other parallel track is the... The woman who was with Roosevelt, uh, or one of the several, uh, who was there at Warm Springs, Georgia, April she 12, was the last uh, one of the last to see him alive and got the hell out of there real quick. His his lady friend. Well, no, I'm not worried about her. I'm concerned about the Russian woman painter Shumatov, Elizabeth Shumatov. That's the one who, is, who was she there. Was, now she was yeah. she was brought in, and she was. You can see the portrait that she was painting. That's you know, correct. That's yeah, published in various. But places. was she not friends with uh, Roosevelt's uh, paramour? Lucy Mercer. So we have Lucy yeah. Mercer is the is the love interest of of Roosevelt. But this Lucy Mercer, who who knows what she thinks or understands, mm-hmm. she invited in allegedly the Shumatov to do a painting. And the problem then is that Shumatov is an anti-communist white Russian emigre. And I'm afraid if you look back to the to the period uh, between the world wars, think of it like this: in our time, I'd say in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you often assume that one of the pools that the CIA could draw on for uh, tasks, let's say, mm-hmm. were the anti-Castro Cubans. Right? These, these and these people go, you know, all around the world, all different things. Watergate, right? All those people, Bernhard Barker, and so forth. Those are really Cubans. You find Cubans mm-hmm. in the preparations for 9-11, Cubans in, uh, the, well, obviously, the Bay of Pigs, right? Felix Rodriguez, Max Gomez, all these people, Ramon Chichi Quintero, so that the anti-Castro Cubans are the big pool, right? You can also go back to the 19th century. It's very often Italian or Polish anarchists. But in the period between the wars, it's anti-communist Russians or white Russians. And these are people who hate Stalin and quite right. some sometimes have Hitler sympathies, but they also hate Roosevelt because they fear they accurately estimate that Roosevelt was saving uh, Stalin from being destroyed by by Hitler, or at least contributing a lot to that. So she's there, and she's got her paint box with her, and it doesn't seem to be any indication that anybody tried to examine her paint right, box exactly right. to see what chemicals were present in these colors. Right? Does she have you know blue green yellow arsenic strychnine cyanide right mm-hmm. well, what does she have there and Pr- there's Pr- this other Prussian, thing where she Prussian it's blue. recorded it's recorded that she would often dip her brush into a wine glass that had wine so you could imagine that kind of action going back and forth and maybe reaching over to roosevelt because roosevelt was drinking continuously uh, in these times or quite frequently anyway so there's a there's a, a, a body of uh, suspicious evidence. Now, the, the, big, the big question then, of course, is what's going on here? Mm-hmm. And here, the, uh, the principal source, and it's a, it's a very good source. It's as good as any source you're going to find on, on World War II, is a book called As He Saw It, 
and the he is Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the author is Elliot Roosevelt, who accompanied uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the father, on the uh, trips to the uh, Casablanca Conference and then the Tehran Conference of, uh, of 1943, mm-hmm. and talking about the meetings with between Roosevelt and Stalin and the clashes with, uh, with Churchill. And the dynamic was that the, 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 the tension between Churchill and Roosevelt was huge. And this, this starts actually at the, um, the conference uh, on the British battleship Prince of Wales off the coast of Newfoundland during August of 1940, where uh, we get the Atlantic Charter, right? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from fear, freedom from want, right? The Atlantic Charter, the war aims of the of the future uh, allies. But at that one already, there was a clash where uh, Roosevelt says, look, you know, the British Empire is going to have to be liquidated, and your, your 18th century methods are going to have to go by the board. And at that point, uh, Churchill is so much in need of pleasing Roosevelt and getting things from the U.S. that he doesn't dare um, overdo his rage-filled with response. But it's clear that the British at this August 1940 conference, they already get the idea that if uh, the uh, Anglo-Americans win the war, their problems are only going to be beginning because Roosevelt is going to act to dismember the British Empire, which, in fact, he started to do in the months before his uh, death. Right. So uh, that's the, 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 the root of the, of the hostility is, is primarily that. What's going to be the layout in the, uh, in the post-war world? And it's overwhelmingly that Roosevelt is going to essentially detach these areas. Right? He's going to make sure that the former British colonies get independence, right, in the way that India did. And, and, uh, and Egypt, of course, took another uh, 10 years or... Or so, but uh, this was going to be the the big push, right? They were going to become independent, and then, yeah. of course, the idea was the U.S. was going to then have uh, economic relations with them. So there's the a British... tremendous amount of intrigue going on here. This is what I think we're getting already. Uh, this is multi layers of stuff. Yes, uh, uh, there's a, there were books about the uh, the house on R Street, that is to say, a British spy ring run by this character intrepid Sir William Stevenson. Mm-hmm. The British security coordination in New York had worked to get uh, to uh, essentially to to counter pro-Nazi propaganda forces in the U.S. and so forth. But then, as time went on, and forty-two turned into forty-three and forty-four, this British security o- uh, operation, and the the key person that I should probably mention is the uh, the author of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> Roald Dahl, D A H L, was a British spy in this uh, operation on R Street. Mm-hmm. This is now part of an embassy, but he uh, they schemed and schemed and schemed to make sure that Harry Truman would be the vice presidential candidate with Roosevelt in uh, November 1944, not uh, the uh, the New Deal uh, forces, right? The uh, the Secretary of, uh, of Agriculture at yeah, that they, time was considered... You know, they, uh, they made a 90-degree turn away from that, at least. Was considered uh, yeah, pro-Soviet. Now, the, the Secretary of Ag- Agriculture, right? You know who I mean. Uh, yeah. He was... He, so the, and, and the idea was, if you were going to have Roosevelt liquidated, uh, then um, you couldn't uh, have uh, this uh, Secretary of Agriculture. My God, it's got to come to me. But... Uh, so instead you have Harry Truman, and Harry Truman, of course, is this little uh, ward-healing uh, politician. He's very corrupt. He works for Boss Pendergast. Boss Pendergast is in jail, and uh, so could Harry Truman be in jail at any time if certain people wanted to have him to have him in, uh, Henry in jail. Henry A. Wallace. Henry Wallace. Yeah, there we go. And he was... He had some problems, too, right? He had problem mysticism. He had all sorts of things going on. But Wallace was the guy who, uh, you know, who the British did not want, because he would have represented a continuation of the alliance with the Soviets. Now, here's the thing. Uh, was the Cold War inevitable? And the answer that I would give is no, not inevitable at all, and especially not inevitable in the way that it came. Um, 
If you go to the end of 1944 and the beginning of 1945, you will find all sorts of indications that uh, the U.S. political system was more favorable to Stalin and the Soviets than to uh, Churchill and the British. And part of it gets in a couple of aspects of a little story tonight. Go back to then and also bear on now. Mm -hmm. uh, Greece is the, uh, the key element here. You'll remember that um, Churchill had flown to Moscow in uh, October 1944 and had a uh, conference with Stalin in which they exchanged these percentages. And the percentages, right, this is a very dubious uh, thing, but uh, Churchill says, look, um, why don't uh, we have 90% uh, Russian predominance in Romania, the British get 90% of Greece, and 50-50 mm -hmm. in Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stalin can also have 75% of Bulgaria. Right? So they write these on a piece of paper. And it's like a board Stalin, game. Stalin puts a check mark. Now, here's what it comes down to. Uh, when the German forces retreat from Greece in October 1944, the people who take over are the communist guerrillas, because right? they're the ones who have been fighting the Nazis. E A M E L A S, E M L A S. So, British British troops have come in by uh, order of Churchill, and they start restoring the monarchy of the king George the uh, Second. I think a Nazi collaborator and a court full of Nazi collaborators. And um, Churchill writes an uh, order to the British commander, General Scobie, says, Scobie, you treat Athens like a conquered city where a local rebellion is in uh, progress. And when we get to December 3rd, 1944, there's a rather considerable massacre of communist uh, demonstrators in Athens shot down by British occupation forces. And at that point, Churchill tries to bring in more troops into Greece. And uh, the uh, U.S., the State Department, and uh, the, the uh, Pentagon by then, Admiral King, say, look, we're not going to let you use any American tr uh, transport ships to take your British troops into uh, Athens. So the bottom line of this is, by the end of 1944... Americans hated the British, uh, or dis, you know, distrusted the British yeah. more than they did the Russians. This is that, a completely that, forgotten episode. That's quite it's an amazing, very powerful. Yeah, quite amazing uh, to hear you say that. Hold on, back in just a couple minutes. Uh, the British were th thugs, uh, in my view, just hate them. Uh, back in a moment. Stay tuned, and we shall continue. Okay, let's get right back to it with Webster. Uh, the end of World War Two. The Dividing up the percentage games, like a big The percentages, board game. and then the British massacring all the these, uh, yeah. you know, anti-fascists in, in Athens. And there was a huge backlash, which uh, these are things you just never hear about anymore. Anyway, here's some little bit of documentation. The British embassy in Washington sent a cable back to London saying, Suspicion of British despotism in Europe is now thoroughly awakened in the United States. Public opinion in the United States has rapidly deteriorated against the British. So mm -hmm. Americans are more distrustful of the British than of uh, Russia. So that's one. Now, you, you may ask, what, what is actually going on here? Um, with the big three, it, it's clear that if you have the U.S. and the Soviets and the British, the British are going to be the weak sister. And they are going to be, essentially, the, the dynamic of the, of the post-war world, you can see it even today, implicitly, is that the big contradictions are between the British and the Soviets. And the natural thing for the U.S. to do would be to mediate that or to balance it. Oh, you'd right? think, yeah. And you could say, play one off against the other would be a cynical way to say it, but in effect, yes, that too. Now, remember... The obsession of the British Foreign Office and the British political life in general is that they balance the others. They had done this for 200 years, right? You become the decisive swing factor that can promote either one coalition or another and play them off and essentially profit from their uh, wars, right? The so-called T 
Tertius Gaudanes, the third party who stands by and laughs and benefits. Right? Mm. The uh, this is a you know That's a well-known a, concept. An interesting in, uh, uh, statement. It's not like Gaudi almost egotur, but it no, was it's close. Gaudanes. He's he's <laughs> enjoying it as you know a third party. It's the let's you and him fight. Got it. Uh, and and then the third party who can uh, come and pick up the pieces now. Uh, we had seen this in the Roman Empire, right? We had the first triumvirate, right, Jeff? Let's yep. see if you got your Roman history, right? We have Caesar, Pompey, and El Crassus, right? The, El Crassus being the guy who was it's so not, rich. Uh, and, we used to call him Crassus, but that works. <laughs> then the, the second triumvirate, more institutionalized, Mark Antony, Octavian, right, the later Augustus. And then there's this guy that you wonder who he is, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, Lepidus. No. So the word was that Churchill had a Lepidus complex. He didn't want to be the third wheel. He didn't want to be the weak sister. That's funny. He wanted to be important. And if mm-hmm. the other two, if the U.S. and the Soviets had decided to get along, mm-hmm. the British Empire would have been rapidly dismantled, and the British would have dwindled to uh, to something um, you know much less than than they eventually. Well, uh, does this, does, any, does any of this go back? This may be a completely wrong tangent. Does any of this go back to the plans of Stalin when he had one to two million masts ready to roll through Europe and Barbarossa stopped him? Was he headed toward England? Was this a part of Churchill's? Enmity? No, there was. There's. There, I think there's significant evidence that Stalin had a uh, an offensive plan for uh, 1941, right? This That's is right. the so-called uh, icebreaker thesis, yeah. right? Yeah. Lieda Kohl, and it's a guy called General Suvorov, right, who is anti-Soviet, he is anti-Russian, he's Ukrainian, as it turns out. But, um, yeah, but that was, you can imagine Hitler and Stalin uh, as, you know, cowboys facing off, and who's quicker on the draw, mm-hmm. and it turns out that Hitler is quicker on the draw because he has smaller forces, right? So, yes, but that's, that's now long in the past, right? The world has turned over several times. I just wondered times. if there was any lingering en- en- enmity uh, between the two. Go ahead. You're, you're, you're but you right. have to remember that the, the conflict between Russia and the British is probably the deepest in all of world politics. It's thoroughly masked, but that's the whole story that's of the 19th century, yeah. without fail. And then it reasserts itself after, you know, after, the, uh, mm-hmm. after World War I. So... There's this Lepidus complex, and the asset that uh, that Churchill has is Avril Harriman, who happens to be the boyfriend of his daughter-in-law. And, and what I mean by this is Churchill had a an alcoholic son, Randolph Churchill. That guy's wife was Pamela Digby, mm-hmm. uh, and she became then um, the wife of Avril Harriman later on, but his girlfriend already during World War II. So that when you look at Harriman, you're actually looking at a member of, of the Churchill family. Hmm. And the role of, of, of Harriman is, by this time, Harriman was the U.S. ambassador in Moscow, as we've mm-hmm. just covered. Mm-hmm. And he does everything possible to play the U.S. against the Soviets uh, in the interests of the British. The idea being that if you can engineer a break, if you can get a Cold War, then the British become absolutely vital to the U.S., right? Then they get everything they want no, of course. Uh, yeah. uh, because they're indispensable, right? Because otherwise, without them, then you, you, know, you don't really have a position in, uh, in Europe. So the, the idea, let's just use one, one key example. At the end of April 1945, right, 70 years ago, we have the separate surrender and secret surrender of the German forces in Italy uh, by this... Uh, SS General Karl Wolf, or Wolf, mm-hmm. and this is done with Alan Dulles, of course, right? Alan Dulles being pretty much part of the same faction, Wall Street Anglophiles, as, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. as, uh, as Harriman. So Stalin, essentially for Stalin and his group, the separate surrender, uh, in other words, the attempt of the SS in, uh, in Italy to surrender to the British and the French only, is this nightmare vision, which, you know, there were lots of people yelling that it was time to turn the German forces around and send them back east again, uh, armed and supported by the U.S. and the British against the, uh, the Soviets, right? Yes, and Patton, right? This, this you know, criminal, criminally irresponsible um, character shooting his mouth off with this stuff. And, oh. of course, the guy's and a reactionary, okay? Huh? He was murdered, too. 
Americans. Well, yeah, fine, but uh, I have no sympathy for this guy because you're know, trying to start World War Three on the ashes of of World War Two, right? Let's not make him into a hero. This guy, you know, this this was an, a, a horrendous proposal to make at the time, right? And he lost any claim to sympathy that I can see. So now, the thing though is. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, by April, he's in Warm Springs, uh, Georgia, right? So he's getting these messages where Harriman says, I want you to send this cable to Stalin, right? And uh, the line is always, you know, you're breaking your commitments. You can't be trusted. I don't like you anymore. <laughs> All this stuff. And you can see that the, the last things... That, uh, that Roosevelt did on Earth. I believe, actually, the last political action that Roosevelt took was he, he had sent this, this cable to Harriman where he said, I consider this Italian incident as a minor misunderstanding. And Harriman sends back, I want you to take out the word minor. It's not minor. And Roosevelt sends back, no, you write that it's minor, because that's how I want to treat it, right? Hmm. I do not wish to delete the word minor, mm -hmm. since it is my desire to uh, make this misunderstanding into a minor incident. So, and then within uh, less than an hour, Roosevelt was dead. So the last thing he did was to try to avoid the, uh, the Cold War, and he therefore he, you know, he, he fell in that, uh, in that effort. Now... Interesting. All right, we have to pause. That's a good okay. place to... Uh to stop by. There was a documentary on PBS about Roosevelt. I, I think the guy who did the Civil War, Ken, what's his name, Civil War Burns. documentary, Burns. I think he did it. And it was interesting. They they did very diligently sidestep the issue of poisoning. They did mention the Russian artist and the girlfriend were there and that they got the hell out of Dodge real quick. And they got up. They, and also, there was never a moment never. where the, the no. contents of that paint box was looked through. Never. Nope. All right. And there's uh, also another person that you haven't mentioned, right? There's Lucy Mercer, the girlfriend. Then there's the Shumatov, the white Russian emigre uh, painter. Painter, yeah. And then there's a Russian man who uh, was the photographer who worked for Shumatov, right? Sometimes she would need photographs to use later in filling in different things and so forth. So he was also there. So three of them departed immediately, and that paint box was never examined. Nobody and I suppose she threw the paint box into the first river, and that was the end of that. Harriman, that goes to the State Department, mentions Stalin thinks that the president was poisoned and wants Gromyko to view the body. Mm -hmm. And then we have this other story, 46 or thereabouts, right after the war, where Stalin says the same thing to Elliot Roosevelt, who very unwisely d didn't uh, publish it. should have been published uh, in a timely way, but wasn't. He, he waited, he waited uh, what, 40 years to, to publish it. Not, yeah. not so good. So this is sort of the, uh, the terrain. And look, just to, uh, to complete this sort of framework before we go into the political issues, mm -hmm. if you look at the U.S. delegation at Yalta, right, so they, they have to go all the way to the Black Sea, and this is a very complex combination um, trip. Uh, they're then housed in these old czarist palaces, some of which had been used as uh, vacation homes for workers or the wounded in World War II. But they're in bad shape, right, because everything in the Soviet Union is bad, badly kept because of the tremendous... Now, I would like to call everybody's attention to what I've written about this. Uh, this is in uh, my website, right, tarpley.net, and uh, it's the, the, the article involved starts from the coup d'etat of April 12th, 1945 in Washington. We're sort of getting into that, the geometry of that anniversary, right, 70 years ago. Uh, April 12th, 1945, Roosevelt died, but of course he didn't just die, he was poisoned. This was an assassination. And to, to sort of set the framework for the entire thing. After the war, the uh, son of President Roosevelt, and this is um, Elliot Roosevelt, mm -hmm. went to meet with Stalin. He went to visit Stalin in the Kremlin uh, to interview him, right? to interview him for a, a U.S. Uh, publication, right? journalism, I think it was Look Magazine, Gardner Cowles. So, well, this is now back to the after-the-war meeting, and said, look, you don't seem to understand 
your father was murdered. And, and uh, Elliot Roosevelt is shocked. What do you mean murdered? Right? This was supposedly a uh, you know, natural causes. And Stalin then, according to the uh, the text, the text was only published in uh, the mid eighties, mid nineteen eighties. You can see all the stuff on Topley dot net. It's called British coup d'état in Washington, April twelfth, nineteen forty five. How the Harriman Gang started the Cold War. Uh, uh, so. Uh. This, Stalin uh, says, this, uh, your father me, was sir. murdered. Hang on. Yeah, your right father ahead. was murdered. What do you mean murdered? By whom? Stalin roars by the Churchill gang. And then, he, uh, then Stalin also says, not only did they successfully kill your father, they've been trying to kill me, Stalin, ever since. Uh, uh, so this uh, obviously compels uh, attention. So we have it corroborated, right? Uh, the original report from uh, during the course of this Stalin said, um, I have a, a resentment against your mother, Eleanor Roosevelt, because she would never let Ambassador Gromyko of the Soviets view the, the body, uh, the dead body of, uh, of President Roosevelt. Right? She always insisted that the coffin be kept closed. Mm -hmm. And Stalin said that he, he resented this very much because Gromyko uh, had uh, tr training enough to be able to recognize the symptoms of poisoning. So he told, the guy that, he, that Stalin first told this was U.S. Ambassador Avril Harriman of Skull and Bones and the, uh, the mm -hmm. Brown Brothers Harriman yeah. uh, banking house, uh, co-partner with Prescott Bush, who financed Hitler, and, and the rest of it. Stalin said to Harriman immediately, I believe he was poisoned. I want my ambassador to view the body. So that was sent in, but the, Mrs. Roosevelt kept saying no. And then... Stalin turned to Elliot Roosevelt, the reign of the, of the war, right? Unimaginable by anybody else in the world. So there were rats and the, pump, the plumbing is bad and so forth. But on the way home from the Yalta conference, uh, one, one top member of the U.S. delegation drops dead, and that is this guy, Pa Watson, the military advisor to President Roosevelt, who had served him for quite a number of years, and this was a tremendous psychological blow. He died sailing home. Harry Hopkins, one of the, the absolute key people in the economic recovery and then in the Lend-Lease deliveries, right, the U.S. economic mobilization to right. keep Russia, Britain, and China, all three of those, they, uh, quite likely one or more of them would have collapsed if it hadn't been for these Lend-Lease deliveries, right? Well, basically, you take it, right? We don't care. We'll, we'll worry about the money later. We're lending it or leasing it to you. We'll discuss the terms later. Right.